real. Mosul, Iraq, 2005. Army Staff Sergeant Adam Lingo is hunting down an elusive enemy. More season kicks. He records his unit as it conducts raids trying to kill or capture insurgents. People want to see that the sterile, watered-down version of what's going on. They don't want to see, you know, the except the reality that war is nasty. This house-to-house -house combat is not what America envisioned when the Iraq War began two years earlier. Oh, March 20th, 2003. Major Mark Hain is on a top-secret mission over Baghdad. As the sun begins to light the sky, he fears that anti-aircraft batteries will spot his F-117 stealth fighter. I said, well, I could see them. Does this mean they could see me? Think about it. Black aircraft flying in a blue sky is a juicy target. But he remains undetected, reaching his target, and drops two satellite-guided bunker-busting bombs. The war has begun. When he lands here at his base, he's finally told his target, though he suspected it all along. Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. of the engines and, and everything out there, but I could tell that uh, everybody was pretty pumped. Their happiness is short-lived. A few hours later, Saddam appears on Iraqi TV, very much alive, and ranting about the U.S. attack. The next day, President George W. Bush orders a coalition of ground forces from the U.S., the United Kingdom, and Australia to invade. The troops plow through defensive berms and tank traps and begin to cross the border from Kuwait into Iraq. Their mission is a quick strike on Baghdad to take down Saddam's regime which the U.S. accuses of developing weapons of mass destruction. 21-year-old Marine Corporal Marco Martinez crosses this desolate Iraqi desert in the back of a cramped assault vehicle. The former gang member from New Mexico is itching for a fight. We just wanted to go in there and just and get it on with all these people. They wanted to fight us. I mean, I would have got really disappointed if we didn't go. I'd have been kind of mad. Just crossed the border to Iraq about 10 miles ago. This wave of American tanks, trucks, and troops speeds towards Baghdad. Marine Staff Sergeant Nick Popovich, a veteran of the Gulf War, leads his men in a 70-ton Abrams tank. Some guys get nervous, you know, and they're uh, a little worried about it because it is an unknown, you know, and what I would tell them is combat's one of those unique things, you know, you don't have to have done it before to be good at it. Going to war is like the Super Bowl, like you made it, like you're actually performing it. It's like sitting on the bench for a couple years and then all of a sudden getting to play in the game. Martinez is confident, but worries that Saddam's army might use their WMDs if forced into a corner.
could be biological warfare, chemical warfare, blood agents, nerve agents, who knows what's in there. You don't want to come in contact with it, so you just get out. I wouldn't want to be in that area. <laughs> To reach the capital city, these forces must cross over 300 miles through southern Iraq, home to the majority of Iraq's Shiite Muslim population. Saddam, a Sunni Muslim, has brutally oppressed the Shiites for decades. And many Iraqis here are happy to see American forces. Well, the first Iraqi I seen was, was a farmer. and He was looking at my tank as I was going by, and I was looking at him. And I waved at him, and he waved back, and I thought, okay, well, that's a good sign, you know? That night, U.S. forces unleashed phase two of the assault. It's called shock and awe. A barrage of airstrikes on government and military targets all over the country. It's designed to convince Saddam's 400,000 troops to surrender. Baghdad residents awake to find parts of their city in ruins. Corporal Martinez sees signs that shock and awe is working. All the way up to Baghdad, it was just littered with green uniforms. All over the ground, deserters. And I remember I turned to uh, this guy named Garcia. He was, on my, he was on my fire team. I said, you know what? This is going to turn into a guerrilla war. Watch. After the airstrikes, U.S. tanks annihilate the enemy. Incinerated Iraqi tanks litter the roads, while U.S. ground forces decimate remaining pockets of fighters. These Marines encounter an Iraqi army unit eager to surrender. So those are your men. Do your men have weapons? Do your men have weapons over there? <laughs> They say we leave it over okay. there. Go. Okay. We had an entire battalion surrender to my, my squad. They obviously knew what they were doing. They had been trained, but they just didn't have the heart to fight. If they actually wanted to fight, we would have taken heavy casualties. I remember thinking to myself, well, we all could have died here. Martinez pushes on. Part of an Allied operation on its way to becoming one of the fastest armored assaults in history. It kind of became a blur because, I mean, I'm, and I'm being realistic, we didn't sleep for the first three days straight. We didn't sleep. But the sheer speed of the run up country presents daunting challenges. Vital supply units in the rear can't keep up with the combat units leading the way. Sometimes we ran out of food, ran out of water. Just supply couldn't keep up with us because we were going that fast to Baghdad. One of those supply convoys falling behind is the Army's 507th Maintenance Company. Somehow our vehicles, our company vehicles, just kept breaking down and people getting stuck in sand. It was just kind of a one thing after another nightmare. 19-year-old Private Jessica Lynch from rural West Virginia sits nervously in the back of a Humvee with two others in her unit. Most of us were you know, 19, 20 years old. This was our first war. Straight out of high school, we weren't really sure what to expect. The 33 soldiers in the non-combat unit are trained and equipped with only the most basic weaponry. Early on the morning of March 23rd, Lynch and her comrades lose sight of the Patriot anti-missile convoy they're supposed to be following. When you look around you and you see a thousand other trucks beside you and then the next time you look around and there's nothing i mean there's sand as far as you can see we weren't even on a road they've been on the move for two straight days exhausted and disoriented the 
company makes a fatal mistake. Instead of going around the city of Nasiriya as planned, they head straight into its unsecured center. At first, it's quiet. Then suddenly, Lynch hears a shot. We knew that we were in trouble. And then as we were going along, I mean, it was just constant fire from both ends. They attempt to retreat, but they can't maneuver their 18-vehicle convoy quickly enough. Lynch is trapped in a hail of gunfire. She desperately tries to get her weapon working. There was so much sand jammed up inside of it. It wasn't working, plus you were shaking so bad where it was just nerves. And it was just a kind of a, well, this is it. Let's pray and hope we make it through it. Just then, a rocket-propelled grenade hits Lynch's Humvee. They slam into another army truck. And then the next thing I knew, I woke up inside of an Iraqi hospital. I knew that I was in the hands of our enemies. Are they going to kill me? Are they going to torture me? What is going to happen to me? The attack kills 11 soldiers in Lynch's convoy, including her best friend and roommate, Lori Paestua. Iraqis take five others prisoner. Soon after, survivors from Lynch's unit alert Marine commanders of the ambush. The Marines had been planning a deliberate assault on Nasiriya. Now they rush in to rescue soldiers of the 507th and secure the city. One of them is 21-year-old Private Alex Nickel from Humboldt County, California. Nickel and his unit have been in country for days and still haven't fired their weapons. But as their assault vehicle tracks into the city, they sense that's about to change. I was a good buddy. He just looked down and like you could see it in his eyes. He just said he just shot somebody and that was kind of the first sense, like we're taking rounds. His vehicle stops and Nickel gears up. And all I can think of was saving Private Ryan when they just get lit up in the U-boats. I mean, they just run out and start shooting whatever moves at that point. There's no rules of engagement, so I mean, dogs, chickens, everything got shot then. Nickel and his fellow Marines confront Iraqis both in and out of uniform. It's the first major battle of the war and the first large U.S. death toll. 18 Marines die. That same day, 30-year-old Army pilot David Williams flies his Apache attack helicopter toward Karbala a key access point to Baghdad. It's protected by an entire tank division of the Iraqi Republican Guard, Saddam's best trained and best equipped troops. I was a little intense, a little nervous, because uh, we had never gone up a force this large. And knowing that over Kerbala and Baghdad, the Iraqis still had quite a bit of the air defense uh, units. They're 25 miles from their target zone when Williams and his gunner, Ron Young, fly over the town of Hilla. They're startled by what they see below. There's a lot of people walking on the streets uh, with rifles. And here it is, we're going beyond midnight. And we thought to ourselves, that's kind of odd that all these people would be out. And all hell broke loose at that point. Uh, the entire town just lit up with any aircraft fire. Williams attempts evasive action. But his Apache is riddled with bullets. Ron was screaming, turn left, turn right. And at that point, I knew uh, that we were going down. He fights the controls and manages to crash land in a rice paddy. With sunrise approaching, they scramble from the wreckage and flee. Ron and I evaded for about an hour and a half. In between the rice paddies, they have these irrigation canals. And Ron and I had gotten to the water uh, with just our noses above the water. 
But the Iraqis scour the area and eventually discover them. I was struck in the head with the, uh, the stock of the AK-47. Ron took one to the back of the head. And at that point, they uh, bound our hands behind our back. The next day, the day's soldiers appear in this video on the Arab TV network Al Jazeera. I can't believe this is happening. I don't want to die in this country, uh, knowing how the Iraqis treat the prisoners. And uh, all the while, I thought about my little girl and my little boy. Their captors ask them questions about their mission. Williams stonewalls. What about days before? I've not done any mission days before. Like Private Jessica Lynch, Williams and Young are at the mercy of a regime known for brutally torturing its enemies. For the first time, they had somebody that they can punish. I was very concerned on what they would do. It's less than a week after the invasion of Iraq. Army Captain Carter Price from West Virginia commands a company of 14 tanks en route to Baghdad. Price thinks his men are ready for anything that comes their way. Until he sees this, a massive sandstorm. It looked like you were on Mars. A photographer with Price's unit captures this picture. That's real, that's not a camera effect. Because of the way the light hits it, it turns everything red or orange. The storm stalls the invasion for two days. It gets in everything. It's, uh, you can't see. You can put your hand in front of you like this and you can't see it. It's, it's, unbel <laughs> it's unbelievable. My battalion commander, when that sandstorm lifted, he looked over at, the, at his wingman's tank and said, what's next, locust? When it clears, Army and Marine units mount up and keep pushing north. For a week now, 19-year-old Private Jessica Lynch has languished in an Iraqi hospital bed, terrified and severely injured, a prisoner of war. There was a point where I thought I would never be found. This was how I was going to die, you know, not getting help, not, you know, ever seeing my family again. On April 1st, she thinks she hears a helicopter and then shouting right outside her room. I wasn't sure who was standing on the other side of that door and what they wanted. That was kind of the moment of truth for me. Are you in any pain? Where's those windows go out to her? It's okay, it's okay. As the minutes rolled by and you know, they started talking to me. One even ripped off the American flag off his uniform and handed it to me. So the more they kind of talked, the more comfortable that I got. So here with you, Jessica. They rush Lynch to the waiting helicopter. Make sure we get a good count, guys, as she comes in. And her nightmare ends. There you go. You're so doing glad great, Jessica. You're doing, You're doing wonderful, okay? Welcome back. Just like I realized, oh my gosh, I get to go home and I get to see my family and I get to eat a turkey dinner with mashed potatoes and applesauce. Lynch's rescue isn't the only good news for U.S. forces. Saddam's army is rapidly disintegrating and still hasn't used weapons of mass destruction. As time progressed, the issue of WMD kind of went to the back burner, and we were more concerned with, with fighting these, these different factions that were found within Iraq. But with the Iraqi army all but defeated, U.S. troops immediately face a new and deadly problem. They can't distinguish friend from foe. Is this one, one minute they're smiling, the next minute they're, they're trying to kill you. It's hard to fight a war like that. 
80 miles southeast of Baghdad, these Marines set up a checkpoint. They're trying to identify Iraqis who may join a growing guerrilla force, ready and willing to kill Americans. Certain indicators to look for, uh, the haircut, the boots, uh, shoes, uh, how well they are dressed, how much money they are carrying. They nabbed this 20-year-old walking along a road from Baghdad. He has a book containing notes supporting Saddam's regime. All right. He ran up to Baghdad, and then he came back down south. And the whole time, he kept this book. He knew if we found this book, he was going to get in trouble. He claims the notebook isn't his, but his story doesn't add up. He's my cousin. I, and I was writing, and just I want to give it back to him. Tell him if he's lying, he's going to get himself into more trouble. The interrogation uncovers no solid evidence. I, I think this kid might just be confused. So they let the young man go, not knowing if they made the right call. Almost three weeks into the invasion, U.S. soldiers and Marines continued tightening the noose around Baghdad. And British soldiers are securing the cities of Umqasr and Basra. Marine Staff Sergeant Nick Popovich and his tank company are among the first Americans to enter the Iraqi capital. They make their way past burned-out buildings to Ferdos Square in central Baghdad. They circle this statue of Saddam as a crowd gathers. And they saw this image of Saddam, which is something they'd always been conditioned to be fearful of, to be oppressed by. And now all of a sudden they see it surrounded by American tanks. And they say, hey, wait a minute. Maybe we don't have to be scared of them no more. And then before you know, I mean, there's hundreds of them out there. And then it starts to turn into a celebration. Then an Iraqi child approaches a U.S. Marine with a proposition. And he uh, goes up to the vehicle commander, Gunny Lambert, and he says, Mr. Mr., can you help us pull down the statue? So it was just a kid. It was some kid's idea. Whoa! But not all American forces get this kind of welcome. Two miles away, a convoy of Marines comes under heavy fire while driving past Baghdad University. They take cover and organize a counterattack. The Marines use an armored personnel carrier to ram the university's outer wall. They split into small units and methodically take out their targets. Soon, troops all over the city see resistance come to a stop. Everyone was greeting us with flowers. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, you know, people kissing us and stuff like that, and it was just a really warm reception. And it felt really good at, at that point. You're like, you know, I'm doing something great. 28-year-old Marine Lieutenant Brian Chantosh looks at the scene in Baghdad and believes the job is done. While Saddam is still missing, Chantosh feels it won't be long before U.S. forces track him down. We thought that that was the end state. We're in Baghdad now. We did it. Like, we're Saddam. Like, as soon as he gets captured, like, go into the palace, capture him, put him in handcuffs, and we're done. Like, let's get back on the plane and go back to the States. 60 miles north of Baghdad in Samara, Iraqis still hold Apache pilot David Williams and his gunner Ron Young prisoner. It's been three weeks since their helicopter was shot down. The Iraqis have tortured them 
Williams has begun to give up hope. The idea of losing your family is a separation that you had to make during captivity to, to let them go. Suddenly, he hears a commotion outside his cell. I mean, just all of a sudden, in an instant, and uh, the door was kicked open, and these Marines started running through the building, and they were screaming, get out, get out, get out. Marines rescue Williams and Young, along with the remaining captured soldiers from Jessica Lynch's unit. I mean, just the, the sheer joy, you know, you don't know whether to cry or, or, you know, I mean, it was so hard to control your emotion. Uh, it was just incredible. Within days, Williams and Young are reunited with their families. And uh, it was just incredible to, to be able to hold my wife in my arms again. <laughs> <laughs> Back in Iraq, taking the lid off 24 years of Saddam's oppressive rule is having unanticipated consequences. U.S. forces in Baghdad stand by helplessly as anarchy takes hold. The Iraqi state-run organizations that keep good order and discipline in the city of Baghdad are now gone. They're now eliminated. Uh, and so there was a period of euphoria for a couple days, and then the looting began. It was like the L.A. riots times 20 that it was just a free-for-all. They thought that in America, that's the way America was. You just do what you want when you want. And you would go to a building and the door frames were gone, the hinges were gone, the wiring in the building was gone. If it had any value at all, or had ability to be taken from that building, it was gone. The Iraq war is only six weeks old when President Bush declares major combat operations are over. The United States and our allies have prevailed. These sailors are finishing a 10-month deployment, but thousands of other troops, including Army Captain Ryan Howell, are just beginning theirs. Howell arrives the first week of May in the vast Anbar province, home to many Saddam loyalists. He immediately feels uneasy. It was a feeling of two people almost, you know, like we're on one side of the street, they're on the other side of the street, and we're stand, staring at each other. It was like a, that uncomfortable high school dance moment where you don't know if you're going to go up and talk to the girl, to ask her to dance or not. It was kind of having to make this up as we go along initially. 28-year-old Howell and his unit conduct daily patrols from a forward operating base, or FOB. These bases are set up outside cities and towns all over the country. They're designed to keep U.S. troops separate and safe from the native population. When Howell leaves his FOB, he patrols crowded markets and can feel the resentment. Imagine just being surrounded by just hundreds and hundreds of people just walking around. And you're just sitting there in the middle of them going, okay, whether or not I'm welcome here or not, I don't feel right being here. In June, Philadelphia native Gary Bishop is on his way to Iraq for the first time. I remember flying into Baghdad, me by myself with a bunch of tank parts, and I'm wondering, what am I getting myself into? Uh, have I been trained to do this? A am I capable of doing this? What if I can't do this? The lieutenant colonel's job is to restore basic institutions and services like schools and electricity. Back up! That job gets a lot harder when the U.S. completely dismantles Iraq's Sunni government, firing tens of thousands of members of Saddam's ruling Ba'ath Party. With the debathification, a lot of the civil apparatus, everything from the trash pickup to the power station to the radio, all the things, again, that we take for granted as far as public works, it's pretty much abandoned. As Bishop tries to pick up the pieces, the U.S. sets up an Iraqi governing council dominated by the long-oppressed Shiites. The Sunnis are resentful, 
Out of work and out of power for the first time in 35 years, they start to hide in the shadows and ambush Bishop's unit. For a period of time, it paralyzed my unit because it's a faceless enemy. Um, they're hidden amongst the crowd. Soldiers hated to go on patrol. Army Major John Noggle immediately recognizes this Sunni rebellion for what it is, an insurgency. An insurgency it strikes and then it dissolves away, and, and the conventional army is left with nothing to attack, nothing to hit, nothing to swing at. Most of the insurgency is in what's called the Sunni Triangle. On July 23rd, part of Captain Howell's regiment is in a convoy headed toward Fallujah. 60 miles west of Baghdad. Suddenly, an explosion rips through a Humvee. It kills one soldier and injures seven more. Howe learns that the explosion was triggered remotely by insurgents hiding near the road. That was the first time we really understood that, okay, there's these, these things, these roadside bombs. These improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, are cheap and easy to make and use. They soon become the insurgent's weapon of choice. Howell's unit realizes the Sunni insurgents have caught them flat-footed, completely unequipped for IEDs. I'll tell you, my Humvee that my, my group of soldiers rode around in, it had uh, canvas doors. It was a normal aluminum Humvee. From my own little personal part of my world, our vehicles were not armored at all. IEDs are made from everyday materials and detonated either by a pressure sensor or remote control. We saw the evolution of, of IEDs from using vegetable cans packed with C4 and wires in a blasting cap um, to a more sophisticated where they put IEDs encased in concrete and are built into the road Troops jury-rig their vehicles trying to protect themselves any way they can. We put sandbags in the floorboard. We took uh, old flak vests. Anything we could, we would put out there. But it's the people planting these deadly devices that are the real threat. When Major Noggle arrives in the town of Kaladia in September, he finds a growing insurgency and it's getting help from foreign fighters. We faced a homegrown domestic Sunni insurgency, but we also discovered that Al-Qaeda in Iraq had a substantial presence in our sector. Foreign Al-Qaeda fighters are entering Iraq, looking to kill Americans, sow hatred between Sunnis and Shiites, and drive the U.S. out of the entire region. For many insurgents, their rallying cry is still Saddam Hussein. Interrogator Eric Maddox is with a special operations unit. For the last five months, their mission has been to find Saddam and arrest him. Maddox interviews over 300 Iraqis trying to figure out where he is. Finally, on December 12th, he interrogates a man in Saddam's inner circle. So I brought him in and told him there's only one thing we're going to talk about, and that's the location of Saddam Hussein. He said, I don't know where he's at. I said, yeah, you do, and you're going to take us to him. After hours of intense interrogation, the man finally breaks. And he said, he's in a farm just east of the Tigris River, south of Tikrit. A special forces unit immediately flies the informant to the farm. Soldiers spend hours scouring every inch of the place. They find nothing. Then, without saying a word, the informant kicks a patch of ground. Soldiers take a closer look and spot a rope. They pull it and find Saddam Hussein hiding in this hole. With over $750,000 in cash. There was a ventilation fan, a light, an area where he could lay down. Obviously, I was extremely excited, but I also realized we're at war, and there's 100,000 U.S. soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine out there who are still getting after it. 
In fact, Saddam's capture does little to change things for them. That same day in Kaladia, an explosion rips through an Iraqi police station. Major Nagel rushes to the scene of carnage. I mean, literally picking up pieces of human flesh and, and um, gathering evidence and talking to, to the people on the scene, trying to, to get intelligence on what happened. In the end, he finds 26 Iraqi policemen and two young girls dead. December 13th, 2003, for me, will always be the day that al-Qaeda attacked the police station with a car bomb not the day that we captured Saddam Hussein. The capturing of Saddam Hussein did not end the insurgency, did not um, significantly change my life. The car bomb on the police station did. The bomb throws the town of Kaladia into chaos. There were riots in the streets. It so happened that uh, there had been an American helicopter flying by at about the time the, the uh, car bomb blew up and the Iraqi people in the sector were convinced that it had been a missile strike by the American helicopter rather than a car bomb. Despite evidence to the contrary, Nagel can't stop the rumors from spreading. And it's not just here. Rumors implicating U.S. troops and attacks run rampant throughout the country. Once they were told something, that became the truth, regardless of how outlandish it may have been. It was almost as if we were combating rumors as much as we were combating enemy combatants. The Iraq war is a year old. Second Lieutenant Neil Prakash and his tank platoon are stationed in Bakuba, 40 miles north of Baghdad. They conduct six patrols a day, trying to find IEDs and stop insurgents from planting them. But it's frustrating work. When you clear a route, the space around the tank where you are, that's cleared. The minute you drive away from it and you take your eyes off it, it's not cleared. IEDs are the biggest killer of US troops in the war. Responsible for more than 100 of the 379 killed in action so far. On one mission, Prakash and his men are ordered to park their tanks in formation beside a road. It's called route security. Like out of all the hundreds of miles of highway in Iraq, maybe that was secured, right? We're sitting there into the second hour of, you know, sitting on our tanks, me and my wingman and my crew, you know, we're just bull****. <laughs> the IED blows up behind us, 500 meters behind us. I turn around. And I, like I see a dust cloud, and I, he just blew up on nobody. Among the soldiers coming to grips with the new threat of IEDs is 20-year-old combat medic Kate Norley. She joined the Army the day after 9-11. Now, more than two years later, Norley is heading into Iraq. She's at the wheel of a Humvee with a gun in her lap as she nears the border. Should we come under fire, I need to be able to continue driving, return fire, and also make sure that I'm, I'm looking for anything suspicious for possible IEDs. And so the second when I was told, oh, hey, we just crossed the line, we're officially in Iraq, it all of a sudden was just kind of this freeze. Okay, I mean, is this, you know, game on? Norley's medical battalion sets up a trauma center at a U.S. base in Baghdad. One day a call comes in. An American unit has been hit by an IED. I remember very well um, seeing, uh, seeing a vehicle pull up. That was a very distinct smell, like a burning smell. Um, and I could see that one of these Humvees was just riddled um, with bullet holes. And I thought that I would, I thought that I would freeze. I had, I had kind of expected that moment for me to freeze, and I didn't know how I was going to react. Norley falls back on her training and kicks into action. But as she approaches one Humvee, she sees there's nothing she can do for the two soldiers inside. Pretty much they were um, me melted down um, into 
um, the seats of their Humvee, and they carried pictures of loved ones with them. And when I saw a picture of, of a, um, a small child, and there was not much left of it, but my first thought was, you know, I, their family doesn't know this. And it was, uh, that was, and that was really hard. Machine gunner Colby Buzzle has also seen the damage an IED can do. His striker vehicle is just as fast as a Humvee, but armored like a tank. I was really lucky. I mean, if I was, a, if I would have been in a Humvee, I would have been, uh, I probably wouldn't be here right now. You know, I mean, uh, was, uh, every single vehicle in our platoon got hit at, at least once by an IED, RPG, or a rocket, or all three. Buzzle and his unit kill and capture some insurgents, but have a hard time identifying their targets. I remember this feeling of, like, where are they, what do they look like, uh, sh I don't know where they're at with it, you know, just um, that kind of feeling, you know. Up to this point in the war, the one group American troops thought they could trust were the Shiites, who had long been oppressed by Saddam. Army 2nd Lieutenant John Caldwell patrols a vast, poor Shiite area of Baghdad called Sadr City. So far, it's been relatively peaceful. But by April, Caldwell and his men see groups of mostly young Shiites begin to protest the U.S. invasion. They're called the Mahdi Army, and they're organized by this man, Mutada al Sadr. More and more young men were, were joining the, the Mahdi army. Um, I think it was something for them to kind of cling on to, a cause for them to cling on to. Um, it gave them a sense of identity. Sadr is supported by neighboring Iran. He's trying to convince Shiites they should fight to overthrow the U.S.-supported governing council. We were actually within two days of officially handing over our area of responsibility. And then April 4th happened. On April 4th, heavily armed groups of the Mahdi army storm and seize control of police stations and neighborhoods in southern Iraq. Twenty-eight-year-old Army Staff Sergeant David Bellavia and his squad fend off the Mahdi assault in Muqtadiyah. One sniper shoots at them from a house, so the Americans unload a barrage of gunfire, killing him. When Bellavia enters the house, he makes a startling discovery. The sniper was shooting from his own child's bedroom. The idea that a husband or a father could use a window that his child is sleeping in to engage our military is uncon... I mean, we couldn't imagine, you know, but when you react to that contact, you take a civilian loss, and that's, that's devastating. Bellavia learns quickly that the enemy has no rules. Using Iraqi civilians, even women and children, as shields or decoys is part of their strategy. Every one of those guys with a weapon system, every one of those guys fall back to areas that they knew that they had a cache. Um, the use of civilians, the use of children uh, to move munitions back and forth, they, they played on our, on our moral compass, they played on our Western sensibilities. The Mahdi army eventually folds under the sustained counteroffensive. But 2nd Lieutenant Caldwell questions what progress, if any, the U.S. is making in Iraq. If I go ahead and just shoot up this whole town and, and, and kill everybody in my sector and destroy every building, I haven't really accomplished anything then, you know? We're just playing the same old game of shoot them up, and that doesn't lead to anywhere. Marine Gunnery Sergeant Nick Papadich from Indiana has volunteered for a second tour in Iraq. He's stationed in Fallujah. Papadich patrols the outskirts of the city in his Abrams tank, ready for anything. 
We heard a lot of bad things about Fallujah. We heard it was uh, the place that even Saddam couldn't control when he had Iraq. Even Fallujah stuck their middle finger up at Saddam. This city of 300,000 has become the nerve center of the Sunni insurgency and headquarters of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. The first several days of patrols are relatively calm for Papadich. Then, in late March, four American security contractors lead a supply convoy through the city. They take a shortcut and without alerting Marine commanders, head straight to the heart of Fallujah. Even Marines themselves have steered clear of the area. I don't know why they were driving there. I certainly wouldn't have described that area as being militarily secured at that time, no. I, I wouldn't have advised going through there, that's for sure. The contractors are savagely ambushed, shot, burned, and dragged through the streets. They hang two of the men from a bridge over the Euphrates River. This footage is seen around the world and at the U.S. Marine base just outside Fallujah. You know, a lot of times on the news, you see things that just make you so violently angry and you just wish you could do something about it. That, that was one time in my life that I was actually in a position to do something about it. Papa Ditch is ready. His Marine commanders plan a surgical strike to find the killers. The Pentagon intervenes and instead orders a large scale assault on the entire city. It's the news 25 year old Sergeant Josue Magana has been waiting for. When we got the order that we we're going to push into the city, it was it was exciting. It was it was kind of like a, a sigh of relief. You know, like, finally we're going to go and, you know, this is what we came here to do. The city streets are eerily quiet. 1,600 Sunni insurgents are hiding in the labyrinth of concrete buildings and narrow streets. On April 4th, Sergeant Papadich does a final check of his Abrams tank. The assault on Fallujah has begun. Three days in, Papadich spots a group of insurgents ducking in and out of doorways. He goes after them, tracking his Abrams down a narrow street. It's probably not the most ideal situation for a tank to be in, but every one I kill today is one less that somebody's got to fight tomorrow. So when I have them engaged, I'm not going to let them get away. Then an insurgent fires an RPG. The tank absorbs the explosion. As Papadich readies his 50 caliber machine gun to return fire, a second shooter launches another RPG. I never seen him. And when I went into my machine gun, I heard a and bam, that's when the rocket hit me right, right in the helmet. Blew my helmet apart, blew, uh, blew my one eye out of my head, and uh, knocked my other eye down to my sinus cavity. So for me, what I saw was a real bright flash of light, like a real, like a super intense camera flash, and then nothing, just darkness. And I could hear this like humming in my ears, like if you took a radio and put it on the static, and then cranked the volumes, like this, uh, just in my ears, I couldn't hear anything. A news cameraman takes this video of Papadich moments after the attack. 
was very sleepy, like I just need to go to sleep, and I knew that's a good way to die, so don't, don't go to sleep, just stay awake. His fellow Marines carry him off the tank and rush him to a medevac site. A doctor tries to repair his right eye. And I remember telling the doc, I said, look, I said, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to try and cooperate with you, but I can't guarantee you anything once you go try to pull things out of, out of my eye. He loses that eye and most of the vision in his left one. On the streets of Fallujah, Sergeant Josue Magana and his infantry company continue the assault. When you bust through that door, you're, you're just kind of ready for anything that comes your way. You know, you're wondering if there, yeah, if there is someone looking at you, is there someone waiting for you? Elsewhere in the city, Marines take fire from insurgents hidden around a mosque. They respond by launching a Hellfire missile and a 500-pound laser-guided bomb into a perimeter wall. Arab news channel Al Jazeera broadcasts images of injured and dead, including women and children. The channel claims they're victims of the U.S. bombing. The Marines now believe they're within days of securing the entire city of Fallujah. But the televised images inflame Iraqis. Al Jazeera and many other media outlets spread a message that the United States was being indiscriminate in the use of force, was killing innocents, and that message resonated with the people of Iraq. Hey, watch your fire! The next day, President Bush orders a ceasefire. The Marines remain in Fallujah, but their orders are to not initiate contact. They're upset with the decision. They want to finish the job they started. We know it's not coming from our commanders. It's not, you know, it's coming from a lot higher, telling us, hey, this is, we're going to control you guys from, you know, a thousand miles away, and this is how we want to do it. No, no. The ceasefire makes Marines holding their ground in the city easy targets. Where is he? Oh, let them on the roof. Hey, is that Frohley's on, on the roof? This one right here? Yeah. yeah. On the road. It was one-sided. Um, we still got fired at, motor rounds. Um, pretty much all we can do is kind of just kind of hunker down and, and just not get hit. On April 26th, Magana and his company get fed up with being sitting ducks. They secure two houses near a mosque, the site of frequent insurgent sniper fire, and wait. It isn't long before the enemy comes knocking. The house started, you know, shaking and explosions and Marines started yelling and firing and our house started going, you know, Marines from our house started firing back. And it was just kind of like, holy crap, you know, it's, this is it. Moments later, Magana hears screaming coming from Marines on the roof. He instinctively runs to help. And I heard a pop, and I remember hitting the floor, and I didn't think initially that I was shot. Bring him in here! I started kind of feeling around my stomach, and my finger went inside of a hole. So I kind of looked down a little bit, and the exit wound, you know, my finger went in the exit wound. I guess something in my, in my head was telling me, you know, you're, you're not going to pull through this one. And uh, all I can think of is, you know, you know I'm not going to see my daughter again. Magana asks his sergeant to get a letter to his three-year-old daughter. I just wanted to have something with my writing, you know, something that I read with my hand. It says, 
Hello, my little baby. It's your daddy. Just wanted to write you these few little lines. Well, as you know, probably old enough to understand, I'm in a better place now. Now, I know there is no better place than to have you in my arms again at home, but God had other plans for me. I just wanted to tell you how much I love you. Ganya's comrades carry him on a makeshift stretcher. They get him to safety, but he feels deep regret. I let my Marines down, you know, I should have made a better decision. And that's what really stuck with me and really killed me then. After a bloody three-week battle, the Marines pull out of Fallujah at the end of April. Foreign fighters now flood into the city. The perceived U.S. defeat strengthens al-Qaeda's control over the Sunni insurgency. Soon, another televised scandal does even more to strengthen al-Qaeda's power in Iraq. Media outlets release photographs of American soldiers abusing Iraqi detainees at Abu Ghraib prison. The pictures of that abuse served as incredibly effective recruiting tools. Thousands and thousands of jihadis were created by that abuse. I can't tell you how many guys we buried, American soldiers we buried because of that. That was the worst time for that to happen. You took a hornet's nest and, you, and literally threw it on a bonfire. In May 2004, Al-Qaeda in Iraq leader Abu Musab al-Zarqawi responds to the shocking photos at Abu Ghraib. He beheads American businessman Nicholas Berg in his Fallujah torture studio. The video shows up on the internet. I watched that Nicholas Berg beheading over 100 times, easily. Every time we went on a mission, I'd watch it, make my guys watch it. I used to have the time memorized. I think it took 27 seconds to cut his head off. 27 seconds. I would make sure that everyone fed that into the machine. What we were fighting um, was, was not us. They're not us. They're insurgents beheading people, and we're getting criticized for, you know, the, whatever happened in Abu Ghraib, whether it was like the, the nude photos and the humiliation. I'm like, okay, humiliation or, or murder and execution, which one's worse? The insurgency is still growing by the day, but the U.S. hands over power to an Iraqi interim government. Private Colby Buzzle is told that Iraqis will begin to take over the fighting as well. I remember our commanders telling us that, you know, our job would basically be in support role. Basically, we would act like um, Iraq's big brother, you know, if the younger brother was getting beat up or picked on, we would show up and, and take care of it. But whenever the bullets start flying, the new Iraqi forces are nowhere to be found. As the summer comes to an end, U.S. commanders decide it's time for a rematch in Fallujah. Between April and November, Fallujah looked like it had just become hardened, hardened as an insurgent stronghold, and it just needed, you know, to be cleared out. Like, I mean, just spring cleaning, like just swept out. Many American troops are like Prakash, thrilled to finally face their enemies head on. Just a huge adre uh, adrenaline rush, that's it. That's, I don't know, it's fun. When I found out we were going to Fallujah, I was um, over the moon. I was so excited. I was so pumped up. This was everything I'd lived for. On November 8th, Operation Phantom Fury begins. Artillery batteries unleash a non-stop barrage. Infantry Marine Private Alex Nickel waits at the edge of the city and takes it all in. Fireworks really are kind of lame now. After you see like all this air support and whatnot coming down, it's it's pretty impressive. You think they get them all, but there's nooks and crannies everywhere. Yeah. 
Soon after, 8,000 U.S. ground troops punch into the city. Sergeant Bellavia is pumped. Go, 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 go. But his initial move into Fallujah is met with chilling silence. The first maybe four blocks, it was, I didn't, we didn't see anything. Not a thing. I mean, we peppered that place. It was just this eerie quiet. That's because insurgents and foreign fighters have taken shelter in buildings like these. U.S. forces conduct search and destroy missions, hunting the enemy house to house, room to room, and door to door. Go! Go, 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 go. Company commanders like 30-year-old Brian Chantosh guide their men through the maze of narrow streets. As they creep through the city, they don't know which buildings hide insurgents, so they have to search them all. Every door opened, every room looked in. No rock unturned was pretty much uh, the, the guidance I gave. I didn't flinch. I didn't stutter step one time. I was gung-ho the whole time. Didn't matter. Just, just caution into the winds. Spirit, I'm going to make it out of here or I'm not. As Sergeant Bellavia moves slowly down the streets, he sees signs that insurgents have learned how to defend against an American assault. They know we like to, to take, you know, doors and get on rooftops. I mean, it's no secret. We've been doing it all year. They bricked up every single entrance, windows, doors that were facing our breach point. The only door that was exposed, there was an IED there. Another thing is we like to jump from rooftop to rooftop. They would smash our roof down. So we'd fall from the roof to the second story, which is like a 15-foot drop, break stairwells off inside homes. And, and literally force you to take the route that they had planned for you. Get on the roof. Hey, we need to get up there. There's nothing up there. It's just a flat roof. This, this piece is missing right here. It's all gone. In one house, Bellavia, fueled by adrenaline, spots a wounded insurgent and runs after him. Bellavia shoots the man and chases him into a room where he plunges a knife into his chest. He just got weaker and weaker and just like ran his hand through my hair and just slowly brought his uh, his hand down, you know, on my cheek and and um, yeah, you know, it was probably the worst moment, you know, of my life at that moment. He wasn't a an animal anymore, you know. He wasn't a bad guy anymore. He wasn't a surgeon. Uh, he was a, a person fighting for his life, and I was taking it, you know. In November 2004, Captain Brian Chantosh and his company of Marines are in their eighth straight day of urban combat in the Sunni stronghold of Fallujah. On this day, they're looking for remaining insurgents His men are beyond exhausted and living on adrenaline. The range of emotions that Marines would, would feel every, like, thousands of times a day. Boom, hey, I made it, I'm alive. Like, I just kicked that door down. Okay, now I gotta go to the next door. Okay, that house is over, good. Building's clear, go outside. Oh, we got another one to do. That rise and fall of, of emotions and uncertainty that a Marine would have to endure throughout the day, and it was taxing. They're ordered to comb a mosque for weapons when the enemy attacks. They take up a position on this rooftop and target the source of the gunfire. Insurgents hiding in houses near the mosque. The whole division's got them surrounded, and now they don't, they don't want to give up. We tried talking to them with our interpreter, getting them to surrender, walk out on the street. They're telling us they'd rather die than uh, then come out and surrender, so they're going to die. Five seconds! Chantosh orders an airstrike. Yeah. 
As night falls, Marines walk to the houses. They sift through the rubble. All told, they discover 21 dead fighters. We're gonna have to check out the body, sir. The second battle for Fallujah lasts 10 days. And takes a large toll. 70 Americans die. Still, U.S. troops kill over a thousand insurgents. It's a victory for the U.S. and Sergeant Bellavia savors the moment. Fallujah was a battle that I needed, that we needed, to show that we were, that we were doing the right thing. The morale, I think, was slipping. We needed something. And when you looked around Fallujah, it was very easy to see who the good guys were. And uh, we, we killed bad, and I think um, it was a good thing. But the ones that get away, like Al-Qaeda in Iraq leader Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, keep Second Lieutenant Neil Prakash up at night. We let out a lot of guys. Like Zarqawi was able to flee, you know, flee the city. We let out a lot of military-age males because we told them, there's a deliberate mission coming through here. If you're a civilian, clear out. The insurgents quickly regroup and reemerge in and around Baghdad. Everybody who escaped Fallujah came into our, our area. And that was our job to stop them from coming into our area and see who we can capture. Sergeant Jay Olmo is from Queens, New York, and Specialist Daniel Maella is from Brooklyn. They're part of a tight-knit National Guard unit called the Fighting 69th. In December 2004, they run regular security patrols near Baghdad with their scout platoon. Being stationed near the Iraqi capital means they're more likely to be hit by an insurgent IED than anywhere else in Iraq. Sergeant Almo tries to catch insurgents in the act. Sometimes we would just sit in the fields in silence with the trucks off, with night vision optics going all night just looking around to see what we can catch, who was digging in the roads, who wasn't digging in the roads. And the way that these people usually made money was to either blow one of us up or to do something bad against us. In early December, Olmo and Maella are in a four Humvee convoy. They're returning to base when they hear a sound they've come to dread. I heard a pop and I turned around and I saw just like a plume of smoke coming up. Olmo runs to the wrecked Humvee and finds his staff sergeant Henry Irizari and his crew badly injured. When I got there, the truck was actually cut in half. There was no more engine, there was no more front tires. There was actually, I mean, literally, the front of the truck was gone. The bomb causes massive injuries to four soldiers. Irizari, almost squad leader and mentor, is in the worst shape. The Izzy was actually blown out of the truck. I grabbed both his arms, literally, and they weren't there. I went straight through his uniform. So I was like, ooh, that's not gonna be good. And he had nothing left to him, really. But he was still alive. They medevac him to a military hospital in Baghdad, where doctors try to save his life. We stayed out there on that scene, stuff that was blown up, uh, everything. You don't want to leave anything for the enemy to use against you. So our commanders had us out there forever. Later, Almo gets the news that his friend Izzy is dead. Man, it felt like your heart being ripped from your chest, because he was the guy who pretty much was holding it together and now it's not there. He was getting ready to go home on leave in just a couple days. I mean, he was counting down the days and uh, he was gonna be home for Christmas and then, you know, then just like that, he wasn't. Three months after the IED kills squad leader Henry Irizari, the Fighting 69th has moved south. They conduct patrols on what's called Route Irish, connecting central Baghdad to the airport. It's known to troops as the most dangerous road in Iraq. If you're somebody that wants to hurt American troops, then that's the place to go, you know. Chances are you're going to get somebody important, you know, not just, not just your average guy. Maella is patrolling Route Irish when suddenly... 
I didn't see anything. I just, uh, you know, it was a, a pop. And but I remember getting hit, and I'm just feeling hot. And um, I lost a couple of teeth right here. And then I realized, you know, I, I had lacerations all over my face, and, I, and I, one eye was, like, swollen shut. I got out of the truck, and um, I just saw my whole uniform was covered in blood. And I was kind of staggering around. I remember just being kind of useless and, and banging on the door. The blast kills two more members of Maella and Olmo's unit. I blame myself every single day for not being there. I should have went down with my crew. It wouldn't have changed anything, whether I was there or not, but I still feel like I should have been there. Maella recovers from his injuries, but also struggles with guilt. It's hard for me because I was responsible for that truck, you know, and, and they're not here anymore, and I am, so it's... Uh, so it's something that, uh, that I'm still dealing with, you know. By April 2005, IEDs are killing an average of 17 troops each month. Despite the danger, Captain Brendan Heatherman and his unit patrol on foot. Their mission, not just to kill insurgents but somehow win over the hearts and minds of Iraqis who are being terrorized by them. If you're in your vehicles, in the armor, then you're completely cold and distant from the people that you want to get to know. I wanted them to see a human being there. Army Captain Ryan Howell and his unit conduct patrols in a small city called Tel Afer, near the border with Syria. They're anxious and have good reason to be. Tel Afer was called Al Qaeda's town. Everywhere you turn, the boogeyman was out there. Part of his mission is to prevent foreign fighters from slipping into the country and attacking U.S. forces. If they get past Hal's unit, they have a clear shot into Mosul, 30 miles to the east, and straight into Staff Sergeant Adam Lingo's area of operation. A lot of guys that would come across the border from Syria, call them the weekend jihadists. They'd come and fight, fight the jihad on the weekends and then go back to work in Syria, you know, during the week. Lingo grabs his camera and records his unit as they conduct raids, trying to kill or capture these weekend warriors. About half of these raids turn up insurgents. But the rest of the time, Lingo and his men are just kicking down doors of innocent Iraqis. And I would get pretty upset every time we would do a raid and it would end up being a, a bogus raid, you know? Um, and and I, I wouldn't blame them at all for being upset about it at all. I mean, I, I would be pretty upset too. Lingo comes to believe that high intensity raids are doing more harm than good. So they try a very different approach. We definitely stopped using explosive breaches and stuff like that. We would basically knock on the door they soon discover that this simple human gesture goes a very long way with the population. Marine Captain Brendan Heatherman from Oklahoma uses a similar human touch about 150 miles south in the border town of al Qaim. He has his men do patrols on foot. He's trying to get the people to trust his men so that they'll help the Americans identify insurgents. The stuff that really made it happen is um, individual patrols meeting with people. Um, we used to call it patrolling meal to meal because what do human beings do? They converse while they're having a meal. So we, we went, had tea at this house and you know, lunch over here and dinner. Sometimes they would provide the food, sometimes we would, and it worked out like that.
In the second half of 2005, U.S. forces go on the offensive in both Al Qaim and Tel Afer. Troops kill or scare off dozens of foreign fighters. But unlike previous operations, the Americans don't fall back to their isolated base. Instead, they hold their ground, living with the newly trained Iraqi security forces in small bases throughout the city. Anytime somebody decided they wanted to make trouble in this area, fine, we're going to stick some soldiers in your backyard. The new tactic works. It prevents insurgents from returning to areas and terrorizing the population all over again. We were really able to keep a continuous pressure on the enemy or have continuous interaction with the population.